Uh, welcome to uh, the Cainsham Area Forum. And obviously this one's been uh, a while in coming. Um, not quite sure what that is, something to do with a uh, COVID problem. So it's nice that we can at least meet in this fashion. And whilst we'll talk about the date for the next meeting, it would be nice to think that perhaps at the next meeting, we can come together sort of face to face. Um, either side of me, I have Alison and Sarah, uh, who will be doing various things. So I might turn to them occasionally, um, but uh, they will be doing all the technical stuff and I just sit here and talk. Um, so there will be those who will say, so what's new? Uh, can I remember that, um, or can I remind you please that whilst um, there is other chat presentations going on, if you could please operate on uh, mute. Um, and then obviously when you want to talk, um, if you can enter MSI into the chat function um, or the hand up, whichever you feel more comfortable with. There will be a number of presentations coming through and the aim will be to hopefully get the presenters to run to time and the question will come in at the end of all of the presentations. Uh, if you do have specific questions, if they could go in into the chat and then if time wise, if it's easier for us to arrange for you to have a written response from the presenter, we can do that. Um, but if if you specifically want that answer here and now, then we will try and accommodate that as well. Um, the meeting is being recorded and will be placed on the Council's YouTube channel so that people can view it afterwards should they wish. Um, it, also a case if you don't wish to appear, then clearly the easiest way to achieve that is to turn your video off whilst maintaining um, the audio function. Later in the meeting, um, the the meeting will become the, well, not later in the meeting, after this meeting, directly after this meeting, it will be the annual general meeting of the forum. And if you have any nominations you wish to make for chair and vice chair, then again, can you put that into the, um, into the chat function so that we know if there are any nominations. Currently, um, I'm able to say that I'm happy to continue as chair and Adrian, Adrian Inker, who is currently the vice chair, he's also said that he's happy to continue. If there are other nominations, then there obviously will be um, an election and that will, in, that will be in the way of a poll which Sarah and Alison will set up and will will run. So that's, um, I think, most of the introduction. There are um, apologies. We've had apologies from Andy Waite, Baines Councillor and Chair of Cainsham Town Council. Um, Chris Hounsell, Saltford Business Network. Uh, Councillor John Everett, the, who is the chair of Newton St. Lowe Parish. Uh, Councillor Alistair Singleton, who is a ward councillor on Cain. No, he isn't. He's a ward councillor on Saltford. Um, Don Dury, uh, Compton Dando Parish Council. There, for those of you who have been before, you would normally perhaps expect to see a presentation or an update from the police and the fire service. Um, but neither of those will be attending this evening, but their intention is to continue to be part of um, part of this forum. Uh, the reason why the police aren't uh, here tonight is that um, Sergeant John Bankovic, who probably all of you will be familiar with, um, he's been promoted. And, uh, from everything I've seen and everything I've heard, 
uh, he richly deserves that uh, that promotion. Um, he's made a full commitment to this forum, uh, attended regularly and contributed written reports. So certainly on behalf of everybody who normal, normally assembles for this, this meeting and on behalf of those who perhaps haven't been to a, a meeting before, I think it's right and proper that we formally uh, record our thanks to him and wish him every success in his new role. So that's that's my intro. Um, and we're now going to move on to the local plan partial, um, an update and supplementary planning document consultations. Um, this relates to the planning, transport and regeneration. So if we can keep questions to the end of the three presentations that are coming our way, that would be helpful. Uh, so somewhere out there is Stephen George, Senior Planning Officer Baines, and uh, who I, I don't think I've seen him yet. But, oh, yeah. sorry, Stephen, I can see you now. Yeah, my apologies. And Claire Cornelius, um, who I know is out there um, and uh, actually occupying sort of pulls apart top right and left hand corners. Well done, that's quite good. Um, they will present on the forthcoming consultations on the local plan partial update and supplementary planning document. Um, and these will run from the 27th of August to the 8th of October. Um, we are one minute over their start time. Uh, and on the agenda, um, Claire and Stephen, you are allocated 30 minutes. If I could ask you to do your very best to keep us to time, I would be very grateful. So over to whoever's gonna lead in from the two of you. Great. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, um, well, thank you for inviting us to, um, to speak to you this evening. Um, my name is Stephen George, I'm a senior planner in the planning policy team at Baines. Um, and I'm with Claire as you've, um, uh, uh, as you've introduced. Um, and so I'm going to take you through the presentation and, and um, uh, uh, um, Claire will no doubt uh, jump in at the appropriate moments to, um, um, to, in, um, uh, 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 and, and to embellish uh, um, some of the points that I might be making and we'll be here to answer questions as well. Um, uh, so we can, we can start with the presentation, please. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'm, um, as you've mentioned, I'm here to um, I just give you a brief overview and introduce the the, um, the consultations that we're um, that we're about to embark on. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Um, yeah. So the consultation is. Um, um, we'll start from the 27th of, of August until the 8th of October. That's uh, 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 that's a six-week uh, consultation period, um, and it will it will cover these issues. It will cover the local plan partial update that we've been working on, and three uh, 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 supplementary planning documents that will um, will provide more detail to the um, to the policies that are contained in the local plan partial update. Um, and those are the energy, uh, uh, energy uh, efficiency, retrofitting, and um, and uh, sustainable construction SBD, the transport and development SBD, and the houses in multiple occupation uh, uh, SBD. Next slide, please. We're having a technical. <laughs> we move on to the next slide, please. We're, we're just having a technical issue, Stephen. Just oh, right. give us a minute. Sorry. Okay. Oh, brilliant. That's great. Okay, so the the um, just in terms of the role and scope of the local plan partial update, 
we um, we have really focused on some um, some of the urgent um, uh, issues that council require us to address, um, um, uh, particularly following the declaration of the of the climate and the ecological emergencies. Um, so uh, we've been updating the policies in the, the um, uh, in the plan to better reflect. Um, the way that we can respond to the climate emergency and respond to um, development proposals coming forward. So it's about it's it's about um, it's about facilitating renewable energy generation and um, uh, looking at the policy framework to um, uh, uh, to help to manage that in a more um, proactive manner. Um, uh, uh, looking at zero. Uh, carbon construction and trying to encourage more of that and looking at, at, at sustainable transport as well to encourage more of a modal shift to more um to more uh, sustainable modes of, of moving around um the ecological emergency as well just as important so um we have the biodiversity net gain requirement which will be um i should be coming forward as part of the environment um bill um, which will require uh, um, um, uh, a 10% uplift on um, biodiversity of um, uh, existing development sites. Uh, the third point I've got down there is about the the need to address the housing supply shortfall. I mean, um, I'm sure you, I'm sure you're all aware of the five-year housing land supply uh, 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 challenge that we have and the. Um, by addressing the, uh, the housing supply shortfall now, or the potential uh, a, a, a shortfall, uh, it means we can manage development in a, um, in a much better way, and we can avoid the situation where, where should we fall below the five-year housing land um, um, supply figure, we could be subject to predatory planning applications in areas that we don't want to see them. Um, the fourth point there is about green green recovery. So that's it's about uh, um, it's about protecting employment um, employment premises and employment land to ensure that we've got a um, that the um, the economic future can um, can also contribute to the uh, to the climate emergency. Um, and we've um, uh, uh, we've been updating the policy framework in terms of in terms of green belt villages as well and that was in response to um, a recent uh, legal judgment on that uh, on, on on that particular issue okay can we go to the next slide please okay the implications for for Kensham specifically is um, we're looking at the existing um, um, with just some policy wording to update the um, some of the existing site allocations um, so in particular the, um, the fire station site and the treetop site. Now on, on the fire station site, we're, we're anticipating the potential development of about, um, of about 21 apartments on that site um, and treetops. So I think we're, we're talking about, uh, about um, 30 dwellings um, to be delivered on that site. Um, we're also we're also releasing the safeguarded land for development that has previously been removed from the green belt in the production um, um, it, um, and that was removed when we produced the um, the core strategy and the placemaking plan but but um, wasn't released from development um, uh, um, and a key issue there is about the transport mitigations being in place before before development can be completed. So we've got quite a, a comprehensive policy framework that, uh, uh, that seeks to manage that and seeks to achieve the, 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 the delivery of those transport mitigations. Um, we're anticipating approximately 280 new homes um, to be provided on those site allocations, uh, uh, as well as a playing field for the school. Next slide, please. 
So um, just to give you an overview of where we are in the process and just to recap in terms of where we've been, we had a launch in April of last year. Um, we had an options consultation at the beginning of this year, um, uh, during January and February. And now we're into the, dra uh, the draft plan stage and uh, the consultation uh, will start at the end of August until uh, October. Now, this is a bit more of a formal uh, consultation stage. Um, and the, um, the consultation is really set up uh, 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 um, to, to allow people to, um, to comment on the plan that's put forward on the draft plan and to say whether they consider the plan is um, sound. And that's, a, well, maybe a technical term, but it's, it's, it's about making sure that the plan is justified uh, making sure it's effective, which really means, is it deliverable, positively prepared, um, and also in line with um, uh, national policy. And the comments from this, um, uh, from this consultation will go to the inspector as part of the examination process. Okay, so we won't get the comments, or we won't be responding to the comments directly, but they'll be going, um, they'll be going to the inspector. Um, and so we've got the examination that, that we are we are anticipating um, to take place sometime from December to March next year, um, but that will be down to the planning inspectorate. Um, they will determine when it's it, it's it's proposed to take place, and we um, we would we would anticipate receiving the inspector's report, and, and we and we would be looking to adopt the plan in June twenty. Um, 22. Can we go to the next slide, please? So just, just looking at, at the SPDs, and I should also add that the SPDs, the consultation process on the SPDs is, is um, a bit like a normal uh, consult, uh, consultation process for policy documents, for uh, council policy documents, in that, in that comments received on the SPDs will be Will be considered by um, uh, by officers in the council and uh, with recommendations uh, taken forward for changes or, and for it to be approved. Um, uh, uh, so that's just an overview. But for the um, for this particular SBD, we we'll, uh, we already have two SBDs that um, cover this topic, and, and we've been reviewing them, and we're going to combine them. So there's one document. Um, it's going to be a bit more positive guidance on what can be achieved and how um, uh, and how um, we'll be updating the technological information and presentation, so improving the photos, the illustrations, and the format. Um, we'll be adding a new section on fuel poverty and affordable warmth, and we'll be creating a much more user-friendly uh, website format, so you can kind of click on the areas that you're particularly interested in, say, windows or roof insulation, or, and it, um, I think it will be much more user friendly and um, well, hopefully more people will, will be using it. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, transport and development uh, um, SPD, and maybe Claire can answer some questions on this later on. But there's, but there's four key areas that we'll be looking at. Um, uh, Parking. So we'll be we've reviewed the standards and the design of um, parking or the, um, parking requirements in new developments. We're looking at the ultra low uh, emission vehicles um, vehicle charging. So um, that's looking at the standards for new development. We're looking at walking and cycling infrastructure design, ensuring accessibility. Uh, 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 safety, security, and comfort. And finally, the um, uh, more information on 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 travel plans guidance to encourage more uh, more modal shift. Next slide, please. So, um, just to sum up in terms of the consultation. Um, well, again, twenty seventh of August to the eighth of October. Um, 
it'll be publicized using um, various media, including mail outs. And there'll be a series of events, including virtual briefings and webinars. Um, we will really um, be encouraging people to respond online if possible, because it's I, I'm so much easier in terms of processing that information. But of course, paper copy, um, paper copies are of course welcome. Um, so my request to you really is to encourage um, um, residents and communities to respond to this consultation and to input into it. It's a good opportunity for, for um, people to contribute towards policy making and to make a difference. Um, and just to reassure you that, um, that, that, um, that everything that is said will, will, um, uh, we will have um, uh, uh, careful, uh, um, careful consideration of all the comments that have been made by both the council and, of course, the inspector. And I think that's the end of the presentation. Yes, it is. So, would you like questions now, Chair, or, or, or at the end of the, the other two presentations? Um, thank you, Stephen. Brian, I understand you have a question, and then Adrian, I'll come to you after Brian. Right. Um, I've got a question on the fire station. Um, how will it fit in with the heritage zone plans and the design limitations due to the need for a walkway from Market Walk through to the rear of Temple Street? Um, that's the first bit of it. Uh, and the development of the site will have parking problems because they already have parking problems with Riverside and they park on Temple Street all the weekend without whether it's double yellow lines or white lines or whatever and um, it needs to be addressed because the people that live there have not their parking they're filling up the car park the, the free parking and it stops residents from accessing disabled residents from access, accessing the shops in Temple Street which they wish to use. Okay. I mean, I can answer that, but, but um, uh, I wasn't really going to go into the details of those specific, in, in terms of applications that might come forward, because, but we've looked at the policy framework in terms of, in, in, in terms of managing um, um, planning applications that might come forward. In terms of the numbers of, of, of um, of units that we think is reasonable, um, we think twenty ones, you know, a, a realistic um, number that could be delivered there. But there are lots of um, our policy requirements that would need to be satisfied. Um, so it's it's it, it's always it's always quite difficult to come up with a with a number with any certainty. But but in terms of the market walkthrough, that's still uh, that would still be a requirement of the um development but we're also looking at the area behind the fire station and i, I think there's potential for um the, the area to be considered rather than just the fire uh rather than just the fire station footprint S stephen could i we will come to adrian next but could i just ask that um if there are any changes or anything else such as well such a changes in relation to the other districts that this forum covers, because we try to be very conscious of the fact that it is the Kenchum area yes. um, forum. And, you know, that includes such places as Salford, Corston, Newton, St. Lowe. Yes. Um, and sorry for anybody else I haven't mentioned in that little summary. Um, so I I'll, I'll take Adrian's question first. But if you could have a thought in the meantime. Yeah. Adrian, over to you, mate. Thank you, Chair. Um, there's a couple of comments, really. Um, you talked about the 280 properties that's going to go in treetops and in the fire station. And I mean, that's a very small number of comparisons to what we've already had developments in Cainsham. And I can't help thinking, really, that, you know, we're, to some degree, we're playing catch up. Um, you had, I guess, what, 2,000 properties maybe developed in Keynesham. 
and I can walk around Keynesham, I guess Alan's done it as well, and I can count the number of solar panels on the roof on one hand, on over 2,000 development in the last, what, four or five years probably? I don't know how many of them has got um, hydrogen convertible boilers, I doubt if any at all. The same with the uh, electric charging for cars, again, you can go and count them on one hand. So to some extent, we're playing catch up, and I'm just wondering how that's been built into this, um, into these plans to actually catch up on where we, where we really should be. And I'm amazed, really, that you've had four, literally four years development and without any thought of sustainable developments in those properties at all. And quite frankly, it's a shame. Um, the, the, the second option, and I think it dovetails slightly into the um, transport one, which is coming along later on, but it is about sustainable developments. And sustainable developments is about a number of things. And one of them is access to health services and things like that. If you look where we are in Keynesham, there's only one hospital that you can actually reach with one bus from Keynesham, and that's the BRI. If you go to Bath from Keynesham, you've got to catch at least two, maybe three buses, sometimes even four. If you go to Southmead, particularly with changes to the 17, you're going to have to do at least two buses there, which will take you the best part of probably two hours to get to Southmead. You have to go into Bristol as the other alternative. Um, even the little hospital, South Bristol Hospital, which was meant to be very much part of access by the Keynesham people. Again, there's no direct bus service to that whatsoever. Um, and the BRI is the only one that you can actually directly get to. So it's about actually the sustainability of them. And I, you know, just wondering how these things have been considered and um, how do they fit into the wider picture? Perhaps if I can take your first point first uh, about the, um, I think you just highlighted the, the reason why we needed to update the local plan. Um, um, with a partial update, and to address the climate emergency, and to and to and to really and really strengthen the policy framework in terms of the delivery of of um, well solar panels, PV, um, uh, uh, electric charging points, and it's it's also a changing market in terms of the viability of actually requiring this. Um, developers in the past would have often said was. Um, it's not viable to to deliver all of these things, but obviously there's an increasing need need for them, and hopefully with the revised policy framework, we'll we'll be having more success in the future in terms of um, uh, we're seeing much more of these. Okay, so uh, it, it, uh, that's a key driver for doing what we're doing. In terms of in terms of the other issues, though, in terms of the accessibility to um, um, to hospitals, I think that, I think that's all part of the um, uh, part of the work that we've been doing, or uh, well, that Phil will talk, be talking about um, later on about um, about improvements to public transport. So um, I think yeah, I think um, I think Phil can probably talk about that. In, uh, um, in his presentation and talk about that in more detail. Is that okay? Yeah, that, that's fine. Thank you for that, Stephen. Claire, thank you for that, unless you wanted to add anything um, if, you're, if you're talking to us. Um, <laughs> right, okay, well, we'll move on anyway. Sorry, Claire. Um, Stephen, did you... We're not going to take any more questions now. If there are any more questions, we'll, can you please put them in the chat and we'll make sure that an answer gets to you. Um, can you just tell us, Stephen, the wider picture, if there is a wider picture for the towns and villages around Cainture? Yeah, I mean, obviously the policy updates in terms of the climate and um, uh, ecological emergency related to uh, the whole district, so uh, ranks to all of the areas. I think the key, the key changes as well will be in terms of green belt, um, the green belt um, policies and the changes that have been made to, um, to. I think it's to do with the, the, um, the housing development boundaries of green belt villages. And I'm, I've not been closely involved in that particular aspect of the work, but I understand that there's been um, 
uh, uh, there's been close involvement with all the parishes on that on that work and I think um, and so I suspect there'll be members in this um, uh, um, in this uh, audience who've been involved in that work. Okay, Stephen, thank you for that. Um, and Scott, your comment was noted. Very interesting. Thank you for that. We're going to move on to Phil Wright now from the West of England Combined Authority uh, uh, regarding the Bristol to Bath corridor. Phil, perhaps you could address or disabuse my thoughts, having just done your survey, that it, that it is extremely Bristol centric. And Bath is just thrown in as the sort of back end of the corridor you're talking about. Um, but perhaps I shouldn't say that as the chair, but you know, there we go. I'll leave it to you, Phil. Thank, thank you. Um, hopefully uh, we can get the presentation up. I, sh I should stress right from the outset, um, Chair, that uh, that isn't the case, uh, but hopefully I will, I will do that during my presentation and try and reassure everybody that that absolutely isn't the case. Um, thank you, Chair, and thank, thank you for inviting me along and giving me a chance to speak here. Um, I'm Phil Wright. I do work for the West England Combined Authority. Um, I've been in local government for a, a long time locally, um, and I do live on the A4 corridor, um, and I work, travel um, up and down it, socialise down it, uh, leisure trips. My children travel on it on going to school, um, and I, I do it by a variety of different means, foot, bike, bus and car. So um, I do feel like it's a little bit of a, a, a pet project of mine in some ways. Um, so I, I do feel that there's distinct ownership for this project to make sure we get this right. Um, if you skim down to the next slide, please. So this is the high level context, really. Um, we've got a programme of works um, called the Corridor Programme, and we have got the aims of trying to provide better and more sustainable transport options for everybody. Um, trying to help people move around more easily. And I think the context here is just um, that we know that it's very easy at the moment to jump in a car and drive, and it's not as easy to do something other than jump in the car and drive. And that, that is one of the key aims of this, is trying to provide those options for people to do something other than jump in the car and drive. Um, I can, I can list all these out here. I don't think I need to. I think you fully um, understand that that's what we're aiming to do. Congestion, we know, is a big issue. Um, and, and obviously, there's a whole raft of issues around the climate emergency that, that we need to deal with in the short term. The corridor programme is phased. Um, at the moment, we have two phases. I'm working on getting a third phase involved, which would be a more rural phase. So that may be of more interest to, to, to some of the to people here. Um, and this corridor falls um, in the first phase of the project. Um, we are looking holistically along this corridor at all forms of transport, um, but we are doing this for a whole raft of other corridors as well. And I did notice a Compton Dando men mentioned there, and obviously the A37 um, that does, does touch on that. Um, and the A37, A367, I'm hoping I'll be able to come and talk to, to colleagues along that route, those routes um, that later this autumn. We have got, um, hopefully getting out to the engagement in, in September for, for this one. So um, that it, it is part of a rolling program and you'll see far more of these happening um, and hopefully helping to change how, how we're all going to travel around. Next slide, please. Just a quick map, really, which gives you a um, in a concise way, hopefully, um, just an idea of the scope. I know somebody one of the issues I wanted to raise here was um, the, the Bristol end starts theoretically from the three lamps junction. There was a, uh, the Bristol section of the A37 went out to this level of early engagement last summer. So it's picked up the section of the A4 running past Temple Meads. So we're starting at the three lamps junction, uh, running all the way through all of the settlements along the A4 corridor. And, and I think the, 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 the important thing to consider with this is, and, and Keynesham falls perfectly into this category, is it's not necessarily just on the corridor either, it's links into and away from the corridor. So we want to make sure that we pick that up as well. Um, and and it, 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 may, it may be that there are alternatives to, to, to the corridor as well. So absolutely, we want your input. We want your input to help us to shape this. Uh, next slide, please. 
So the, the simple message I have been trying to get over with this is that we are looking at how do we make it easier for people when they leave their house, when they go out the front door to do something other than jump in the car? Um, how, how do we make it easier to do that? Um, and I, and I'd, hopefully we all accept that at the moment, the easiest thing for most people, unless they're doing a very short walking journey, is to, uh, to, to jump in the car and make that journey by car. So that's absolutely what we want to be achieving is trying to make it easier to do something other than that. That's going to be a long term process. I'm, I'm not under no illusion. I'm not going to be able to click my fingers and that will change overnight. Uh, but we have got the, the target of 2030 um, that we, we need to uh, achieve, try and achieve uh, carbon zero. Um, so that's a challenge. Uh, but we need to put these steps in place now to make that happen. Um, and it's going to be part of an evolving process of us working with the bus operators as well of trying to provide better and more improved services as part of that we do want to create an end-to-end -end cycle route somebody said to me well, nobody's going to cycle from Britbath to bristol um a i could argue that they will but actually this is about connecting communities along this route as well it's about giving people that chance to connect communities and also those connections into communities and away from communities um, and into into the rural areas and into the towns um, along the route as well. So I think that's really important to remember. It's not about getting people to cycle Bristol to Bath or Bath to Bristol. And this is where it links together quite nicely with what Stephen is saying. Uh, this is about that regeneration and growth opportunities. We appreciate that that is already happening. That some of that is already on the table, and we we want to try and mitigate that impact as much as we can. That's clearly uh, an issue which you just mentioned as well, is how, how do we do that? How do we mitigate that impact? I'm not here to give the answers at this point, um, but th that's that's where we, we hopefully can start this process to help to mitigate the impact of those developments. Next slide, please. Well, I, I think I probably don't need to tell you most of this stuff. I'm sure you know it, you live it, you feel it. Um, we know there's a huge reliance on cars on the A4, and it is regularly, frequently heavily, heavily congested. There's certain sections of the A4 which are, are problematic, which are, are heavily congested at both ends, but also sections in the middle as well. Um, significant air quality issues down that corridor, which obviously is a problem when you've got the road running through residential areas and creating health issues for people who live along those routes. Uh, walking and cycling routes are limited. Um, we have some sections of shared use path down there, but they don't connect very well and there's gaps in the middle. So it's not something that would encourage people to, to think about jumping on the bike and cycling sections unless they felt very brave to cycle along the A4. Um, Pre-pandemic, the Brislington and Newbridge park and rides were oversubscribed. Um, I appreciate they haven't been since. The assumption is that they will go back to being oversubscribed at some point. So we need to deal with that and think about how we use them in the future. Um, and it's that length of journey time, I think, is, is that's where I talk about, you know, it's quite what I will get pushed back on quite regularly is why would I go and get the bus when I can just get in the car and do something a lot quicker? How do we make it so it's quicker and easier to get the bus? Um, one of the aspirations, certainly from my perspective, is how do we separate the bus from general traffic? So the bus gets priority at junctions. And it's separated and removed from congestion so that it can get ahead of the, the queues of traffic. That's the way we can get people out of the cars, hopefully. We can get people to think, well, actually, it's quicker for me to get on the bus. And we know that this route, I mean, again, goes without saying, you, you, you all know this. It's a, it's a critical route that not only connects the communities together, it acts as an end to end route for, for people traveling between the two major cities but also it, it acts as a, a, a local route connecting people to, to, to the various other roads going elsewhere as well. So it does a multiple tasks, uh, which makes it a very challenging project. And uh, next slide, please. So the important message really I wanted to give you now is that we are out to what is called early engagement. So we are at a stage of the project where we are collating options about what we can do to try and address the issues which I've just raised. Um, we really need you to help us to do that. Um, we need your input. We need you to tell us about issues that you experience. Um, and I should stress here as well, there's two things here. There's a survey form, which is really important, but there's a map on there as well. And 
I'm very happy to get granular level detail things there where there's a problem with a crossing or there's a problem with a, a junction that specifically is, a, is, is difficult to get across. Um, you know, that, that level of detail is really, is gold dust to us as we build the project, absolutely gold dust. So the survey is running from the 26th of July to the 10th of September. So we've still got uh, two and a bit weeks left to, to add any comments to that. Um, the more comments we have, the easier it is for to collate those options and, and have an evidence base as to why we need to take these forward. Uh, the thing I guess I should stress at this moment, there is no decisions made on any of those options. Um, uh, we're, we're, we've, we, we, haven't, we haven't gone anywhere with it. The point of this is this exercise is to help us to shape those options. Um, and the last slide, please. So the next steps. So I'll, I'll just talk quickly about where we are in the lifetime of this project where we have to build a business case and that's something we have to do to to access the funding so at the moment we are at what is called the strategic outline business case which is the first level of the business case is the very high level strategic i guess the clues in the name there um so what we're looking to do is to uh get the business case developed to a stage where we can submit it to uh, our grant assurance uh, process uh to hopefully be agreed at joint committee in january next year we have to submit by the end of November this year. Yes, yeah, so we've got quite tight timescales on this one. We're doing a whole raft of work around getting that business case developed at this point, but this is one of the key points for us is to get these options submitted as part of the business case. Um, we've got to then determine, one of the questions we're asking is, do we need to break the corridor down into outline business case, which is the next stage? Do we need to break it down to smaller chunks rather than one big outline business case for the whole corridor? And if we do that, can we make it all stack up? Can we make the value for money stack up? And, and, can, and can we work that? Would it be simpler to do that as far as um, construction companies are all trying to work on the same part of the project at the same time? Um, would it be easier to do, do, do one chunk at a time? We don't know the answer to that either. That's something that we're working through at this stage. Um, one thing I think we, we, and after that, we would go to a full business case. So with a fair wind, we can do an outline business case during 22 and full business case in 23 to start construction at some stage later in 2023. We are likely to have funding coming forward uh, that will take us through and um, from 22 to 27. Um, some of you may have seen the, the tweet from Mayor Norris, um, who says that we have a, a funding window of uh, 550 million to 850 million. Don't quote me on those figures, they were off the top of my head, but it's something along that, that line, um, which will be to 2027. And this scheme will be part of that project. So I guess the message is this is this is happening in the short term. This isn't a long term uh, project. This is a project that's going to be delivered within the next three to four years um, with the fair wind. Um, and I guess we need all of you to help us to, to shape that and make sure we get it right. Um, as far as everything else goes on that front, the, 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 the only thing I think I should stress is this. We will be coming back with this. So the next stage when we get to outline business cases to reflect back to you. So we, we'll do this options assessment now, hope you get your input, make sure, make, help to shape it. During 22, we'll come back to you with some designs we'll put back in front of you and say, we think this is what you were asking for as part of this option building. Have we got it right? I'm, I'm not naive enough to think we will get that perfect. And we'll need, I'm sure we'll get lots of comments at that stage. Um, and then we will, but we'll, what we'll also do is give a reasoning as to why we've chosen these. Um, we won't just pl plonk them in front of you and expect to comment on them. We will explain them. Um, and then the, at a later stage, obviously, there will be statutory consultation we'll have to go through as well, be it planning um, or traffic regulation orders or whatever it may be. We'll have a further chance to comment as well. So this is the first stage of a, of a three stage process uh, where you can help us to shape the project. I think that's it from my perspective. Um, and Chair, I'm not sure whether you want me to hold the questions till later or deal um, with anything. That well, we've got uh, we've got ten minutes to stay in time. Um, Duncan had two questions, which you may or may not have read, um, about Everything. pinch points and uh, land acquisition, specifically Saltford. Do you want to enlarge on that, Duncan, or does that sum up? your concern or your question uh yeah that, that, that that's that's fine I, I know that the um problem of taking a uh public transport through on the a4 through saltford and it is called now the saltford conundrum and i just wondered what think they're thinking there is around that and and also um 
do the plans involve any land acquisition uh, at any stage along the A4 for, for this to work? Thank you. Well, I, I can give you, I could give you a very bland answer here and say no decision has been made at this point and we've got nothing to say. Clearly, we have been considering, you know, Saltford. We know it's a challenge. Um, land acquisition, I genuinely can't say at this stage because we haven't been through that part of the process yet. We haven't determined the options. Um, so I, 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 I will play a straight bat on that one. As far as the challenge of Saltford itself is, I think there are many different options we can look at of, of going through Saltford, be it... Um, holding traffic back to let the buses get ahead of the queue um, at either end of the village, uh, uh, yeah. closing closing you know, the livable neighbourhoods approach to look at closing down some of the turning movements to make the traffic move more smoothly through the village. There's a whole raft of options there, which um, hopefully you can maybe have a think about that and think about how um, input on the survey and help us to shape it. Because I guess from our point of view, we can, we can, we can do this, we can go through this options exercise. But unless we fully understand what is likely to be supported by the by the by the general public and, and residents of Salford, um, it, that's very difficult yeah. for us to, to come up with a, a solution for that. And yeah. I appreciate there may be different views, which will be sure. Just, just, just very quickly responding to what you've just said. Can, can you send your raft of possibilities, uh, say, uh, uh, to the Salford Parish Council and to the uh, myself and uh, my colleague as ward councillors so that we, we can actually uh, give you the feedback that you that you want? Uh, there'd be well, no point coming to a conclusion um, that, that uh, wouldn't be accepted by the public. So uh, can you do that for us? When we're ready, when we're at that stage, I'll be happy to do that. Okay, happy to do that thank yet. you. Tim Roberts, you had a question. I can't see your face, Tim, but you're muted at the moment. Still there? Oh, there we go. Uh, trying to get my video going. No worry. Yeah, oh, my, yeah. my question was about buses along the A39. Um, we only have one bus a week, which leaves Marksby at 10 in the morning, gets back at 2 in the afternoon. And the rest of the time, we have to take the bus, the Orly bus, which is very good, to Bristol and change in Canesham. So we are only five miles from Bath and probably a bit further from Bristol. Seems rather strange. Uh, the, we, we have a, I, one thing I didn't say as part of my dis, uh, discussion about the phase programme, there are later phases to that programme. Um, so for, further work will be happening, um, looking at sections such as the A39 um, and how we, how we deal with that and hopefully increase uh, public transport provision through through those towns and villages, um, that that's all I can tell you at the moment. I'm afraid, Tim. Um, it's just it, it will be later phase. And I should stress the later phases aren't too far away. Um, we're probably looking at post 23 when we'll be starting on the so 23 ish. We'll be starting on the later phases, so a couple of years away. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Um, Scott, we're not quite sure. Do you think you've had your question answered in the chat or no? Um, I think Claire was quite helpful with that one. Um, thank you, Claire. Um, my other point was just um, in regards to one of the slides. Um, it looked like quite an accurate map of the area, but there was a link to the Bristol and Bath cycle path. So I was just asking if that was a hypothetical link, which I think it must be. It may be, uh, I'm trying, I, I, I've, let me just have a quick look. To, I think I've got a version of it in front of me. Uh, Bristol Bath railway path. I don't think there's a link on there unless I'm missing something. Scott, apologies if I am. Um, there's a, there's a, there's a, it looks like there's a road going up from there. That may be just a, 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 a it may be. Um, uh, I, think I, think be the, I think that yeah. may be the, I think that may be the, I'm trying to think of the name of the road. Is it the Kensham Road um, that goes up to Bitten? Yeah. Yeah. I think that might be that road. Yeah, sorry. I was just, it was quite quick. It's because I was just wondering, obviously, Kensham's got. Uh, I think 20 is it 27,000 people now and we have to go along a, a road to get to the Bristol bus so far so I was, I was trying to figure out where that was we I mean we we, we certainly will be one of the options we'll be will be interested in looking at is potentially improving those links to the Bristol Bath railway path but I guess from our perspective of the, the broader project we're trying to look at whether we can improve cycling on the whole of this corridor so we have an alternative to the Bristol mm -hmm. Bath, an alternative more direct route to the Bristol Bath railway path because 
uh, I've got one of my very good friends lives in Canesham and um, he, he says that he has to uh, either cycle down the A4, which is not particularly attractive, or um, go on a really convoluted long route to get onto the Bristol Bath Railway path, which then loops around all the all the East Bristol suburbs as well. So, yeah, definitely something. I think it's a strong aspiration of, of the project is to, to improve those links along the corridor. Thank you, Phil. Uh, I think Claire put a, an answer in the chat or a further clarification in the chat, Scott. Um, Kathleen, you, I got a feeling that your question is talking about schools and clean air. Um, yeah. And I'm desperately trying to think of a school on the A4 corridor. Uh, my feeling is that your question is more for Baines than it is necessarily for the West of England Combined Authority. So if you'd like to sort of submit that as an email, uh, I'm sure we will get an answer for you. Is that Thank okay? You. Thank so, you. Thank you for your interest, though, Thank Kathleen. Um, Lisa O'Brien. Lisa. Thank you, Chair. Um, Phil, good evening. Um, thinking about the... Um, <clears throat> The Bristol Bath uh, corridor. Um, the real pinch point is Brislington, which where hundreds of thousands of various years have been spent to try and ease the traffic flow. But the single lane um, turning left to West Town Lane holds everything up and it backs up right through Brislington, right along the um, the Ring uh, dual carriageway up to Saltford, etc. Um, really and truly, one of the, prob the fundamental problems with the A4 corridor is that it's the only conduit to get onto Right, uh, it's the only conduit to get onto the A37 and to the A38. And until uh, the ring road, if you like, is completed and joined up, we're not really going to resolve the fundamental bottleneck. So that is a fairly high level uh, aspiration, but it is one that's been needed to be made for decades. What is your view on that? Well, it's, uh, I, I mean, I guess I should be clear, it's not part of this project, so it's not something we are considering at the moment but as part of this project um and it's certainly not something that is uh considered as part of my phase program at this stage um not not saying it might not come back onto the table at some point um but clearly the 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 driver excuse the pun is is about trying to reduce car journeys um and and impact on congestion in a different way to what we may have done historically which was about providing additional routes for, for, for vehicles. It's about how do we provide alternatives for people to who, who can make a journey by a car that they, um, sorry, can make a journey by another means that they they would have historically used a, a car for. Um, and- I just, could I, Sorry to, to interject again. The reason I raise it, it is because I, I'm going into Bristol. I like to use the Brisbane Park and Ride. And although there is priority given to the bus because of the weight of traffic, the bus can't get through. So I think that although it's, it's yes, of course, we're looking to improve public transport, that you have to clear the pathway and our roads are not wide enough to create those clear pathways. The other thing I, I would like to pick up on um, uh, one the Tim's comment, that generally um, it's very easy to um, determine improved situations for people who want to get to the centre of Bristol and to the centre of Bath. But if you actually happen to want to get to the south side of Bath or up to Clifton or Cotwell or whatever, then you have to have additional journeys in a congested situation. So um, I think sometimes it's a little bit simplistic to just look at improving that corridor um, my, should be mindful that people need use the car for safety, uh, for walk and to stay dry, and also for access to areas that are out of the way. 
Lisa, thank you for your comments. Um, I think you had an answer to the first part. Um, I think your second part was was a comment, um, and I'm sure that Phil hopefully can perhaps put something in an email to you to answer that. Um, so that, as I say, I'm doing my very best to keep us to time. So thank you, Phil, for um, your presentation, for the answers you've given, and if you can pick up on what Lisa has raised in, in an email, that would be very helpful. It's fine with me, absolutely. Right, we're going to move on now. Um, Richard, how long is your question or how detailed? Because I would like to move on. Um, can you be very concise with it, please? Uh, yeah, I'm happy to just leave it in the chat, really. I was, I was just curious as to where the previous plans in relation to Saltford Station or the pro proposals around the station at Saltford fit into the kind of phasing that Phil's describing, or is that really just not not relevant to, uh, to the we're, A4 we're, corridor plans? We're, we're, aware, we're aware of the, uh, the, the feasibility study, which is uh, imminently going to take place. Um, um, and But at the moment, obviously, it's very difficult for us to build any plans around it because it's such early stages. So okay. we'll, we'll keep an eye on it as it yep. evolves. Lovely. Thanks. Richard, thank you for your conciseness and Phil for following suit. Um, thank you again. Uh, we're going to move on now to uh, Kingsham High Street regeneration. Georgie is with us, but Georgie is having a little bit of problem, I understand, um, in talking. Uh, so, Georgie, I don't know how you want to play this. I know you're not doing a presentation, so we will bear with you um, however you want to do it. Um, I've lost my voice, so it will be a whisper, but hopefully you guys can all um, hear me. If there's something I missed, then feel free to like email me. And I know that um, people are here to sort of support me if, um, if, if my voice kind of dries up. Um, I think the first place to start is probably, I can either start with the update on Cajun High Street, or I can start with the Rock Road. I don't mind where you want to start. Let's do the high street. Okay. And then we'll come on to Rock Road, which is quite controlled, but also a big pain. <laughs> um, okay, so the high street um, program itself, um, hopefully you will have seen that we have moved away from Charlton Road Junction. That happened on Friday last week. We had some difficulties with the drainage in that area, which is why we were there for an elongated um, time. Those problems are unforeseen and just part of any construction um, program. We were, you know, um, we did put out comments to the businesses that directly affected um, the timeframes. Um, it was just a matter of reporting the incident back to our um, designers them looking at the detail, coming up with the design, reporting back to everyone. So that's why it took so so long to move away from that junction. But we've moved away. We've completed on 2.1A. We're now progressing on 2.2. The bus stop also came out today. So we're progressing with that eastern side of the high street. Yeah, eastern side now. Um, the Rock Road um, conversation creates some sort of difficulties. Um, I pro it probably is best to just jump straight in with that. There is an update, it is forthcoming. We have a comms protocol that we have to follow. So I need to inform the war councillors, the stakeholders before making any public announcement. That's not to say that people aren't working really, really hard in the background. We just need to follow that process before we make a public announcement that the information is being prepared. It should come out either tomorrow or Monday, hopefully. Um, but people are working really hard behind this, the scenes. And the update on that to provide any reassurance is that Rock Road and the High Street won't be closed at the same time. We will minimize disruption where we can. We are revising things in the background. We are trying to improve on things. So hopefully, the announcements that follow will 
kind of provide reassurance on that kind of um, matter in terms of providing you an update on the works that will happen with the rest of the high street that will follow in the stakeholder update, the business, the trailers newsletter and the press release that will be forthcoming. But as it stands, we had a bit of a delay. We've caught up with the program and um, we are looking to complete as fast as possible, if not before Christmas. That's where we're at at the moment. Georgie, thank you for that. Um, I think everybody understands what you said in relation to the, the briefing has to come out internally first before it comes to a wider audience. Um, on that basis, I don't know that we've had any questions. No, nobody's put any questions, so I'm grateful to you for that, folks. Um, Georgia, I'm very grateful to you actually coming here this evening, well, staying home and coming here this evening. Um, because uh, you had you had a ready-made excuse to back out from what might have been um, a bit of a, a challenging um, exchange. But I'm grateful to everybody understanding uh, the fact that Georgie needs to brief others before it can go public. So, um, Georgie, thank you very much for that. Um, no and, and I hope whatever it is is causing you the problem gets better very quick. It's stronger than it was last week. I do understand that there are some concerns about the provision of the ramp, so I'm happy to talk about that. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. I, I have today emailed you and um, Claire and Helen, because I'm never quite sure who, who needs to, to be the answer to the question. Um, that was raised by Susan Charles, who is chair of the Baines Access Group. Yes. Um, and so she is aware that answers will be forthcoming on that. Um, but as long as some activity is going to take place to make them the dimensions they should be, that's fine, I think. Okay, so to provide any reassurance, um, there. The, the provision of the ramps isn't an afterthought and no one's been forgotten. We are working within very difficult constraints. The curb height at the moment is higher than the finished curb level. So we've got a gap and unfortunately the industry standard ramps aren't compliant. So we're doing the best that we can. I know it's not completely correct and completely compliant. But we are working within the um, constraints that we have and we are trying to make it as safe as possible. It's been reviewed by our contractor. At, you know, we try and improve it where we can. I don't want anyone to sit here for a moment to think that it wasn't considered from the outset and we're not trying to find ways to improve it. The site is moving down the high street. So we're trying to work out a way where we can open up the um, the crossing that's now at Charlton Road safely. Um, and then we're trying to get onto that separate crossing as quickly as we poss possibly can. Um, it's a sure. difficult site. I know that it looks simple, but it isn't that easy. And we are trying really, really hard to make those provisions. Yeah, I, I, th I think everybody accepts the problems, but the access group will expect answers. Mm -hmm. uh, and in truth, I think we should be able to provide those answers um, by telling our contractors what we want of them. Yeah. Um, so, you know, basically that would be my standpoint on behalf of Susan George, Charles, sorry, Susan Charles, Susan George, she used to be a film star, didn't she? Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, if, if we could do what's necessary to get them to comply, that would be great. Yeah, the okay. contractors are very aware. They are looking at it. Right. It's not being overlooked. No, um, okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Georgie. Um, that's... Uh,
I think that brings us more or less um, to the end, although for 10 minutes we have a, a Q&A if anybody wants it. But that said, we've really, I don't want to go into, Q, into a Q&A because we've managed to accommodate that as we've gone forward. So um, I think we'll call an end to the, the meeting itself now. And my thanks to all of you for um, your attendance and your contributions uh, and for basically part partaking in uh, what I think has been an interesting, uh, interesting information session. So we now move on to the AGM. Um, what I'm going to do now is, um, I'm not quite sure what Tim put in then. Go on, Tim, what, what did you put in there? Is that something that can be answered elsewhere or? Uh, no, it, a, a, solar, a company has proposed to put a solar farm near our village. We already have two within a mile. Hmm. This one will be even nearer and double the size of the existing ones. And I, I, they had a Zoom meeting recently to get local residents' opinion. And I wanted to know what benefits the village could get out of it. And the only thing that they came back to me on was, well, you can keep sheep there or you can keep bees there. Well, we have neither um, shepherds nor beekeepers in the village. <laughs> I'm looking for a community grant. What sort of, what is the council opinion on that? Uh, well, I don't know that anybody sat in this forum can offer an opinion in relation to that unless um, Hal or Duncan, I'm looking to see if anybody else is there. No, Hal or Duncan who are um, on the administration side. Uh, I mean, you know, I shouldn't put a view as the chair, but I think it messes up the countryside. But that's, did I say that out loud? Duncan. Is there anything you can add or how? You're, you're muted, Duncan. Councillor McPhee, I think, has left, uh, and myself, we're both on the planning committee. Um, and basically, uh, the planning committee can uh, only consider a plan, uh, well, have to consider a planning application um, a, a, and compare it to the uh, local policies and the national policies. So, we're not in a position to say what can come who what should come forward or we just have to react to uh, to any um, uh, any application uh, so i can't can't comment no all right thank you for that duncan tim does that sort of answer your question in by not answering it as um, it, it well <laughs> yesterday western power had a zoom meeting and i went put the same question on there they couldn't help either but there was a chap from Warwickshire, from an organisation called HEI. If you Google that, you'll come up with, and they are a village. And, and uh, he told me that they've got two proposed solar farms and they expect a 50,000 community grant from each. OK, well, I, I can't give you an answer to that, but... Um... Duncan, is it something that you can take away as a question and pass it on to the appropriate person? No, uh, okay. sorry, no, not my role. No, that's fine. That's all right. We can ask yeah. our sustainability team. To... Um, the two lovely ladies to my right and left are telling me, no problem. We will get you an answer, Tim. Well, that's very kind. Thank you very much. All right, no problem at all. Right, it's um, the AGM now, so I think I'm going to hand over to... Your good self, were you happy um, to chair it, or did I get Adrian to? I think you were going to just run through just a review of the, the papers have been circulated ah. prior to the meeting. So there was a, an annual report um, about some of the activity of the forum. Whilst um, we were all in COVID, and you've all done some amazing things over the last um, uh, nearly 18 months, um, we, we did actually hold some forum meetings. So we did have some activity. Um, over the last year. Um, so that um, report was circulated prior to the meetings. Hopefully you've had a chance to read that. 
Um, but um, just a thanks to Alan and Adrian really for their chairing and, and vice chairing of the meetings. Not only do they have to attend these meetings obviously to chair, but um, they also are required to attend other meetings outside of this. So we're very grateful for their input and support over the last um, over the last year. So I don't think, unless anybody's got any questions um, on the AGM report, um, we could just move straight to the um, re-election of the chair and vice chair, unless there's any new nominations, which we haven't yet received, but I'm assuming that um, there isn't any more unless this is your chance to put yourself forward. No? Okay. <laughs> You're all quite happy um, uh, for the two nominations. So let's go to the let's go to the vote then. Um, so Alison is going to try. Yeah. So <laughs> at the bottom of your screens, um, some of you might be on a computer, some of you might be on a phone. You will have seen pop up um, a poll. Um, and we're Ooh. asking you to vote for um, the first one, which is a reappointment of Alan Hale as chair of Hainsham. Um, and Alison hopefully will um, activate the second poll, which is um, the re-election of Agent Inca as vice chair. Results. Yeah, if you could share results, that's great. I think we've all voted you both back in unanimously. So thank you very much. Thank you. I hope that wasn't too painful. It did work, so that was good. Yeah. A new way of doing things. So yeah. um, so thanks very much. We'd like to say that we we have found the um that doing the forums online has been um better for people to engage and have a wider audience and hope people fill that um, going forward, we'd like to keep trying it on virtually, but also consider perhaps once a year meeting, maybe face to face when we can meet in bigger groups and people feel more comfortable. But, but certainly in the short term, we'll continue to do our virtual meetings um, yeah. and hopefully people will find that quite, um, quite useful in, in as much as you don't, you can have your tea and and listen to the presentations as well. So, yeah. just so, so that so, shot down my earlier aspiration of <laughs> of meeting the next one face to face. But you are you're quite oh, right. Sorry, no, 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 no. No, you are you're quite right. Uh, I mean, could I just thank those who felt they were able to support me um, in the chair, and and also to thank Adrian who has very kindly been. Um, looking after um, a regular external meeting as well. Um, so Adrian, thank you for that and, and your ongoing support. Um, is that it or do we have... Um, that's, that's it, isn't it, really? Which we have a, I don't think we have a date scheduled uh, yet for the autumn, um, but if there are, are topics that people want to talk about, or bring to the forum. Um, previously, we had community showcases. Um, if there are things that people want to bring to the forum, then please do let us know. <coughs> we do have a meeting scheduled in, I think it's November or December, for a budget meeting. We'll circulate that date, and that will be the uh, council's um, annual engagement around the budget prior to it going to full council um, next year. So we'll have a chance to comment and see their proposals. So. Um, but if people do have um, thoughts about uh, an agenda for the next meeting, then do let us know. Thank you, Sarah. Um, well, again, thank you all very much. And if it wasn't a Thursday, we finished early enough that you can see Coronation Street. So um, thank you all. And uh, we'll, we'll end the meeting there. See you at the next meeting. Thank you all very much.